Our topic for today is one of the most controversial and favorite subjects among many religious denominations, tithes and offering. You can hardly find a religious program in television or radio nowadays without asking financial support or offering from the preacher or radio announcer, telling or even forcing their listeners to give their tithes and love gifts. Is this biblical? Are they really servants of God or just masquerading and just using the Bible passage to get money from people? Our dear listeners, by the grace of God, I beg you to watch out. These preachers must most often use the passage in Malachi chapter 3 to support their agenda on tithing. But what is real tithing and offering? Is tithing and offering equates to money? Sad to say, these preachers abuse and overkill the passage in Malachi chapter 3. Let us together study this subject and understand the spiritual message given to us by the Holy Scripture. All religions adopt the pastoral system where the leaders exercise authority and supervision over the members. The leaders receive remuneration for their services. In Christianity, the source of funds is through tithes and offering. The basis for this practice was when Abraham won over his enemies. Uh, he thanked and praised God and gave him tithes. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 20, and I quote, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Question. Did the descendants of Abraham continue this practice? Yes, Jacob, a descendant of Abraham, followed it. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 22, we can find, and I quote, And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. What rule? This practice of tithes and offering is strictly enforced by God. God said in the book of Malachi, beginning in verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. In verse 9, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. My friend, as a preacher, we strictly enforce these tithes of 10% from our members. How about you? Well, as a bishop of a popular sect, we relax this law when we feel it is too harsh for our members to follow. So we simply require them to pay voluntarily or what the heart dictates. How do you spend your collections from tithes and offering. We allocate certain portion to our pastors for their remuneration, a certain percentage for the maintenance of the church, and the rest of the expansions of our ministry or mission. How do you justify this very important law of God to your congregation? We cited the following verses to the members and they are fully convinced. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I will read, Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charge or charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18, I quote, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muscle the oaks that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Will you cite more verses that the members are really obligated to pay their tithes? This system is clearly endorsed in the following in 1 Corinthians 9.11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? The spiritual things are the religious services, and carnal things are the material remuneration of our religious leaders and their family. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, I quote, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. What benefits do you preach to your flock for following the law on tithes? We always cite the following promises of our Lord, like in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now where we herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall be no room enough to receive it. And our favorite verse is the following in Luke chapter 6 verse 38 in the New Testament. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. What is the penalty cited for violating this law on tithes? This curse comes from the Lord in Malachi chapter 3 verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. After recognizing the true Christ, what is God's revelation regarding this very important law that is called tithes? After recognizing the God that I used to tell the congregation, He is a mystery, incapable of clear identification. The next thing I learn from Him is, only God can expound His intended message from the letter of His words in the Holy Bible. Where can you find that in the Holy Bible? I used to read the following verse, but only now do I realize its great message. Like in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, and I quote, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye, ye need not that any man teach you, but at the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. I found now only a few believe this. As a preacher, I read that verse also, but I was oblivious for its very deep message. For God to emphasize being the only teacher, he also revealed this to James in the book of James in chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraid that not, and it shall be given him. And then in uh, the verse 6, the following verse, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Then, what can you say to our interpretation of the law on tithes and offering? before we recognize the true Christ. Let us review how God instituted this law on tithes. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, I will read, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And then in verse 23, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thine wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Now let us follow God's instruction of reading the Holy Bible, and just as wait for his divine revelation on his words. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10, I will read, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And then in verse 11, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to these people. From this verse, we are instructed to be very specific 
with what God really means by tithes. We used to interpret tithes to mean money, since not all people now are farmers that can produce the objects listed in the offering. Is that what this law requires? Now that I know the God I worship and love, I realize no man can interpret his words as I read in Revelation chapter 5, 1 to 5. The book referred to is the Holy Bible, and no man in heaven or on earth, neither under the earth, is able to open the book. Only the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, clearly pointing Jesus Christ, is authorized to open that book. How about reviewing the objects to be offered as listed in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 and 23? Tight is about corn, wine, oil, and firstlings of the herds and flocks. And what is being offered is to eat in the place that God designates. I will read in Deuteronomy 14.23. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herd. Very clear, the tithe cannot be money. Because God requires the offerer okay. to eat what is being offered. Yes, my friend. Very clear, this is the condition for this important decree of God. Clearly designated as offering are corn, wine, oil, firstlings of the herd. Since God is speaking in parables in Psalm 78 verse 2 and Ezekiel 20 verse 49 in the Old Testament, and more specifically, Jesus Christ did not speak except in parables. Who alone can expound the meaning of the parables? I will read the following in Mark chapter 4 verse 34, and I quote, But without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, expounded all things to his disciples. Did Jesus speak except in parables? Is there anybody who can expound the meaning of the parables? When does our Lord reveal the message of the parable? Let us underscore this, only when they were alone with his disciples. Very clear, therefore, man's interpretation of tithes and offering must be different from the real message of God. What then does corn symbolize as an offering and required to be eaten? God gave us a clue to his intended meaning for corn that is made into bread. This was when Jesus, in his role as Son of God, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. We can find in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, I will read, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Since God is speaking in parable, fasting actually refers to hunger for the word of God. And so this is what Jesus told Satan in verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Does it mean now, Corn actually is the word of God that needs to be offered and eaten? Exactly, my friend. That is why God tells the offerer to eat it in the place that he designates. How about wine as an offering for tithes? Also, Jesus Christ mentioned wine in the Last Supper in Matthew 26 verse 27. And I will read, and he, and he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. And then in verse 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Wine symbolizes the blood of Jesus, shed for the fulfillment of the testament of salvation. Now, how does wine refer to the blood of Jesus in offering for tithe. With the shedding of 
blood of Christ, this made the Holy Spirit accessible to the chosen. Therefore, corn for the word and wine for the Holy Spirit very clearly point to the truth in the word that needs to be offered as tight to the Lord. Hence, the tight that is being offered needs to be eaten at the same time. How about oil? Forming part of the tight, what does it symbolize? Is it not clear since Old Testament time that oil is used for anointing? As in Leviticus chapter 8 verse 12, And he poured off the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. Very clear, oil also symbolizes the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 6 verse 13, I will read, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. How about the first links of the herd forming part of the tithes? First links refers to firstborn. Jesus Christ is the firstborn as we read in the following. Matthew chapter 1 verse 25. And you heard not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus Christ is the truth. This is what is to be offered as tithe, and now it is easy to comprehend why God requires part to be eaten. It appears that all the components of the tithes point to the truth in the word. Let us remember everything written in the Holy Bible has the sole purpose of God, of gathering the souls of His chosen to compose His eternal kingdom. And it is the truth in His words that God can accomplish this. And so to the poor in spirit or the humble that God endows truth to them, in return, He expects them to eat or offer in the place He will choose. Where... Or what is the place that God designates to eat what is being offered as tithes? Well, to the natural man, this is foolishness as it is written in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them or unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. To God... The place is the person with which to share the truth and together happily discussing or eating it. What can we say now is the real purpose of tithes and offering? Evangelism, my friend. Evangelism is the word. It is in offering the tithe or the truth in the word that God little by little forms and establishes eternal kingdom. What can we say now regarding how people take the meaning of tithes? People correctly understood the purpose of tithes and offering for evangelism. However, they substituted money for corn, wine, oil, and firstlings of the herd. Unwittingly, they disregarded one truth in the word, and this is what is not seen. What is seen is, the for the is for the body, while the unseen is for the soul. Thus, in 2 Corinthians 4.18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If the people took tithes and offering for money, what is this to God? The result, is many people again became victims of human wisdom that God hates. In 1 Corinthians 3.18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. In 1 Corinthians 1.19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And then in verse 20, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? What is the effect 
if money is substituted for corn, wine, and oil. The consequence is, what is being spread is the letter of the word that promotes morality. Of course, God also accepts morality, but eventually, this ends in the grave. However, if tithes is taken according to the revelation of God, souls are harvested and preserved in the storehouse of God. Now, something is coming in my mind where God accusing His chosen of robbing Him of tithes. My friend, what you have in mind is what is written in the following. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, again, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. In the following verse, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. In what way do the chosen rob God of their tithes? It is to be emphasized that this is directed to the chosen and not to the outsiders who do not even know God. God accuses His chosen for not having offered their tithes. Very clear now, this is not sharing the truth to others who are willing to hear it. How happy God will be if His chosen offer their tithes. Let us make this very clear. Offering the tithe is actually sharing the truth in the place designated by God. Refers to the person that God knows who is willing to listen to the truth in the word. If tithes mean tenth or ten percent, how does this apply to the truth in the word? To the chosen God in those divine revelation or divine knowledge and wisdom. God does not expect to share all this, but just a portion is enough for Him. Foremost is God's grace for salvation that He offers to everybody, but only a few accept it. Example, who made the testament of salvation? Emphasizing it was the, was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also called Father who made it. Next, what is required in the fulfillment of the testament of salvation? Do many people realize it requires the death of the maker or testator as read Hebrews chapter 9 verse 16? How does God fulfill His testament of salvation when as testator or maker He is a spirit that is incapable of doing it? Finally, as if a miracle, the identification of Jesus Christ is revealed. How happy God will be if the chosen follow this directive on tithes and offering. The following express it all in Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What is the storehouse that God refers to? It is where His chosen gather together and enjoy eating or talking about the truth in His words that God calls meat. If God is happy for the offering of tithes, what is His promise? I will open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. When did God open the windows of heaven? God opened the windows of heaven before the great deluge. In Genesis chapter 7 verse 11, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. With the opening of the windows of heaven, great amount of water poured down on the earth that people perished and only the family of Noah was saved. Perhaps people listening to us would ask, what relevance is this to tithes and offering? 
Before God revealed the truth on tithes, perhaps many people are wondering what relevance is this to the subject. But the clue is given in the following. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 1, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 2, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew. How deep is this message of God that really requires divine revelation? Very clearly, out in the open now, just as literal water killed many people in the great deluge, so does God's spiritual water representing the truth in the word many souls are being killed. However, the opening of the windows of heaven that symbolize the outpouring of spiritual water to Noah it is a great blessing. This is the promised benefit of God to His chosen. Aside from this, what benefit does God promise His chosen? Jesus Christ revealed this to Luke in Luke chapter 6 verse 38. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom, into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. With the spiritual application of the law on tithes and offering, that is sharing the truth in the word, Paul expressed his great spiritual joy for the salvation of souls. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 19 and 20, we read, For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? For you are our glory and joy. And for this, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 18, For the same course also do you joy and rejoice with me. I really wish that as you listen to this broadcast, you understand the true meaning of tithes and offering, which is evangelism, sharing the good news of salvation to others, to the place God designates, or the chosen. Giving our offering by giving ourselves through humility, our time, talent, and energy to the kingdom of God. If we do these things, God promised that He will open the windows of heaven to pour out His true blessings of joy, peace, health, and salvation. God bless you all.